Wow. Oh my goodness. You guys are, this studio audience is fantastic. Oh my God, is there an applause sign up there? This, this, I just have the best team, you know? It's just, I mean, Keaton's talents are endless. Um, I mean, Greg bringing the word. And I'm even watching that, if you could pull up, can we pull up that built in Christ? I don't know if you could pull it up as a still picture, but the intro, the picture of Jesus, where it says built up. Can you do that or no? I'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge them now. I just wanna, you can pull it up and just pause the video. The picture of Jesus where it says built up in Christ. I wanna look at that for a second. Uh, right there. Good job. Good job, let's give them a round of applause. This is good. Like this to me is my life. At the bottom is where I start my journey. And it's unrecognizable, like what it actually is. And throughout our life, we just are shaped and built up into Jesus. And this picture really shows kind of the chaos at the beginning, and then the slow shaping and forming into the recognizable picture of Jesus. And then at the end of our life, we, we look a little bit like Jesus. But then on his head is a crown, a crown of thorns. And the Christian walk isn't easy, and the Christian walk is difficult. And, but today I wanna talk about kind of that bottom section, the foundation. Thank you so much, media team, you're awesome. Thanks for doing that. Good job, good job. So today I wanna to look at foundation repair, foundation repair. And our theme verse this year is Ephesians 2, 22. In him, you too are being built together into a dwelling place for the spirit. That we throughout our lives are being built. We're not completely built at the moment of salvation, that throughout our lives we are being built, being built. And last week I, I looked at what does it mean to envision your life with Jesus and what does it mean to have a loving community around us? And really this is a continuation of that message because once you envision the plans, you look at the blueprint, then you begin to look at the foundation. The foundation is the first thing to be built. The foundation is the first thing to be assessed when you're rebuilding, when you're renovating. It's important to get the foundation right because the foundation supports the building above. Now maybe you've noticed out front in the church we have a bit of a moat out there, a large trench that you each step over every Sunday or whenever you come to the building and what happened there is that we realized that there was a water leak in the basement. And we have been chasing this water leak for months. And it showed up in our kids' classroom downstairs, um, in our green room, what we call. And so years ago, they put a small sump pump in there so that when the water inevitably got in, they would pump it out of the basement. But really, we never addressed the foundation wall. It continued to leak. For years and years, it has leaked down there. It even smells. All the parents can say amen to that. And what we noticed is, so first we fixed that wall. Then we noticed when we took up all the flooring in the big auditorium down there, many of you are like, I don't even know where you're talking about. It's a big room. It's where a lot of the kids will, will be. What we noticed when we pulled up all of the flooring was there was actually water that was coming up through the concrete slab. And we realized that before we can start renovating, before we can start rebuilding, we have foundation repair to do. And it's really important to do the foundation first. The foundation first. Now our main point this morning is when we start renovating a space, 
we're not always sure what we're going to find. Have you ever started renovating and you take off the drywall and you notice that there's some water damage or structural damage or the guy that was there before you built it wrong? Like, have you ever been there where... Yeah, and what, you hap what happens when you begin renovating, when you begin demolition, when you begin to kind of remove what is there, you're not quite sure what you're going to find. In other words, when the Holy Spirit rebuilds our soul, he performs internal repairs. When the Holy Spirit rebuilds our soul, he comes to assess and address the issues inside of us. And sometimes what happens is we think we can just build our life on top of old patterns. We think we can build our life on top of old thinking. We think we can just kind of tack Jesus on to an already pretty cool life. We think we can just add Jesus like a really nice accessory. But when we invite the Holy Spirit in, when we allow him to point out areas of repair, this is called conviction. And demolition stage is the stage of discovery. And spiritually speaking, the demolition is inviting the conviction of the Holy Spirit that we might discover what lies beneath the surface. This might be thought patterns, ways of emotionally reacting. This might be habits decisions, desires. Because what happens, and I've said this before, and it's, a, it's kind of a known phrase in Christianity, is when we're first saved, our spirit is saved completely. But our soul takes a lifetime, a lifetime to be made whole. Our body, our physical body, we'll, we'll just check those in at the grave and we'll get new ones when we go to heaven. And so our spirit is saved, our soul is being saved, and our body will be saved. All of our battles are in the soul. And our soul takes a lifetime to repair and renovate. I don't know about you, but I don't see a lot of positives coming out of COVID. Not a lot of good things have really happened in the last couple of years. In fact, it seems to just get worse and worse. Like in one minute, we're like 2021, thank you, Jesus, that's over. 2022, we're like, wait, it could get worse. But there is one positive in COVID, and I know there's lots of positives, but there is a, a really good positive that I think has, has been an opportunity for all of us during COVID. COVID has afforded us the opportunity to look inward. We have spent so much time with ourselves, we're just sick of the voices in our head. We've spent so much time alone that we've had this actual opportunity to look inside of us and see what is really going on inside of me. Thought patterns, emotions, desires, uh, things that I always did that I shouldn't be doing. And for all of us, as this journey has gone inward, it has revealed that there are some things that don't belong. Our first point this morning is find the mold find the mold. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. We're just entering our second chapter in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 to 3. Paul is writing and he says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. 
following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Paul is asking the church in Ephesus to return to once they were, what they were once like. And he's like, what you were once like is that you walked following the prince of power of this world. Your desires were disobedient. And he says that you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. What Paul is saying is, is Ephesus, remember when you were zombies? <laughs> I hate horror shows. I know you're not supposed to say hate, sorry kids, but I, I don't like horror shows, I don't like movies, I don't like zombies at all. Zombie apocalypse and all these games about zombies, everything is zombies. I can't stand it, but, but the picture is there. What Paul is saying is, is when you don't allow the conviction of the Holy Spirit and you follow the prince of power and you, you, you are a son or daughter of disobedience and you allow the desires of your flesh to overtake you and you follow the passions of your flesh, it's basically like... You're walking, but you're dead. What the Lord showed me is, is Joel, like there's still some things in you that are just dead. There's stuff in you that you're still kind of dipping your toe into the passions of this world. You're still kind of following disobedience. You're still sort of like there's areas of you. Maybe it's just like your big toe and no one really notices. But there's still areas of infection. There's still areas of disease. There's and you intentionally, Joel, go there. Now, maybe, maybe it's not an obvious thing for you. Maybe it's not, you know, drinking and drugs and, and sex and pornography. And maybe these big ones, you're like, oh my goodness, thank goodness I don't have to worry about those things. Maybe it's not an obvious thing, but, but there's insecurity. There's fear. There's anxiety. There's worry. There's things in our life that aren't good for us. A few weeks ago, I was sitting outside. It was on one of these beautiful February sunny days and I was sitting on the, the deck outside and I heard water dripping outside the house. And so I was like, where's that water coming from? So I looked and I realized it wasn't, you know, a hose bib or it wasn't outside the house, but it was actually water dripping inside the house and it was coming outside of the house. So I went inside the house and I looked at, the, you know, I went to the bathroom, I checked underneath the sink. So I went to the kitchen, I checked underneath the sink, it seemed fine. And then I noticed outside of the, the dishwasher that the floorboards were all wavy. Dead giveaway, dead giveaway, there's a problem. So I, 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 I took the dishwasher out. Actually, the dishwasher was so tightly in there that I had to remove the floorboards just to slide the dishwasher out. So now I've ripped up half the kitchen. And I noticed there's a bad connection, the dishwasher to the, to the pipe. And it was dripping and dripping and dripping. I don't know for how long, but there was, it was enough time that there was mold behind the dishwasher, black mold. Disgusting, horrible. So I left the dishwasher out, I went to Home Depot, I cleaned up the mold, I put on a hazmat suit, I did it you know, properly, I cleaned up the mold, had a plumber come in, he put a new connection on, everything was fixed, everything was fine. But see, over time what happens in our lives is things that are unaddressed Things we don't even know exist. Drip, 
drip, drip. After a while, you just notice that, why am I feeling off? How come I'm not seeing success in my relationships? Why is my marriage falling apart? Why can't I keep a job? Why can't I hold on to friendships? How come I feel distant from God? Why do I come into loving community and I feel like I'm the only person that's ever dealing with whatever? And you just sort of slowly isolate. This is what sin does to us. It slowly drips away at our conscience and pretty soon we have mold growing. I found it really helpful to spend time with close friends, people to speak into my life. I found it really helpful to have a counselor to talk to. I talked to my wife. I talked to anyone that'll listen really about my problems. But I find it really helpful. Because what happens with close friends, what happens with a counselor, what happens with people that care about you and love you and make sure they care about you and love you is immediately they're able to say, yeah, this is why that's probably happening. Or, hey, I see this. Or, yeah, you should really this. And then they pray for you and they kind of bandage you up. But if I'm going to be built into a dwelling place for the spirit, there are areas in my foundation that have to be repaired. Our next step after we find the mold is to assess the foundation. Turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 1. I want to talk briefly about um, a man named Nehemiah in the Old Testament. And this is in 445 B.C., and Nehemiah is a cupbearer to the Persian king Artaxerxes. Now, Nehemiah, the job of a cupbearer is actually life and death. That each meal before the king would eat or drink, Nehemiah would taste the wine, he would eat the food, and if Nehemiah didn't die, they would feed it to the king. It was safe for the king to eat. And while you might think that's a horrible job, I wouldn't want that job, it was actually um, a very honored position at the time. He was like a number two to the king. He was in a place of influence, serving the king. But Nehemiah wasn't Persian. Nehemiah was Jewish. He was from the nation of Israel. And he heard that the walls of Jerusalem were broken down and burned with fire. So we come to verse 3. It says exactly that. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. So we have to imagine, and maybe the, the people in Ukraine can imagine this, that the foundation, the wall for protection, the border is broken down. And Nehemiah hears about this and the walls of Jerusalem, the gates of Jerusalem are down. The city of peace has no peace because no walls, no security, no gates, no peace. And there's a lot of lessons within this book, but I'm just going to focus on the spiritual lessons. There's leadership lessons, there's building lessons. Nehemiah is a great book on various fronts, but I'm just going to focus on the spiritual lesson in the book. I want us to look at the reaction of Nehemiah when he heard that the walls were down. Because his reaction to seeing the walls were down are a reaction we can all have. In verse 4, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. This is Nehemiah speaking. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. 
And I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. So when Nehemiah hears that the walls are down, I mean physical walls, when he hears that physical walls are down and physical gates are burned, even before he gets up to go and respond, he prays. Not only does he pray, well, first he weeps and he cries and he mourns. But as he prays, he confesses his sin before God. He confesses the sin of the people. Because Nehemiah knew something that we might not know as the reader. The walls have been down for over a hundred years. The walls have been down since 586 BC when the people were taken out of the city, when they were taken over by the Babylonians. So the walls had been down for a long time. The walls being down aren't anything new. It's just Nehemiah recognized that there was the physical problem was a spiritual problem. And so he confesses his sins and he confesses the sins of the people. Part of assessing the foundation is, is inviting the Holy Spirit in and saying, Holy Spirit, what areas of my heart don't belong? What areas in my foundation need to be repaired? Because Lord, I don't want to start building my life and I don't want to just ignore these issues and I don't want to act as if they don't exist and just continue building on top of this weak foundation. Because if I just go, go through my life and go through my marriage and as a father and as a husband and as a pastor and I just keep building my life on top of this weak foundation, eventually it's going to just crumble. And Nehemiah is saying, before I even go to help, I position my heart in prayer. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me. We have been disobedient. He then goes to Jerusalem for three days to inspect the walls, to find the damage, to come up with a plan, to rally the people around rebuilding the walls. The foundation, now we begin repairing the foundation. The foundation must be strong before we build on top of it. On April 23rd, 1988, there was a brand new Savon Foods opening up in Burnaby. It's a wonderful new grocery store near Metro Town. Obviously, everyone's really excited. So they're going to have a special grand opening. So people flock. There was 600 people stormed Savon. This is the moment I will have the fresh vegetables in the history of the world. As soon as Savon opens, I'll be there. So the people came and they, they parked their cars. And interestingly enough, the way the Savon was designed was the parking lot was over the grocery store. Kind of like Henderson Mall or a place like that where you kind of drive on top of the building. So they open the doors and 600 people come rushing in. Five minutes later, cars came through the roof. Within five minutes, cars from the parking lot ended up in the produce section. 
carrots, bok choy, Chevrolet. <laughs> now, the worst part about it was that they said, it's going to be a special grand opening for our senior citizens. Yeah. Good news, nobody died. Ah, <sighs> I could feel it. I could feel that you needed that information. 600 people, 300 employees, 1,000 people in this building. Look at this picture. 1988. Maybe you see your car in the parking lot there. You see, what happened here in this picture was they, for some reason, upon investigation, and it took like 24 years before this Savon was reopened, due to all the investigating and all of the tests they had to run and figure it all out. See, the problem here is somewhere along the line, steel beams were reduced by 27%. And they don't know why. I know why. Come on, uh, moolah, right? <laughs> moolah. 27%, they reduced the steel beams. And interestingly enough, they actually increased the concrete from two inches to three inches above. And so what happened is, see, with a building, with any building, you have two kinds of load. A little construction lesson. There's a dead load and a live load. The dead load is the building itself. Can it stand up? Can the foundation support? Do the, do the columns support the slab above? And, and you, when you think about it as an engineer, you think about the building itself and the weight of the building coming down into the foundation, into the footings, onto the soil. And you have to think about dead load. How much does this building weigh on top of this soil to make sure the building is going to stand? There's another kind of load, which is called the live load. The live load is, what is the load on a building when there's cars, people, and as people move around the building, it's a different load in different areas, right? So as these 600 people came in and moved about the store and the cars were on top, it created just the right shifting that it collapsed. When I was thinking about dead load and live load, the Lord showed me a picture. When I'm living my life for me, I can get by zombie, dead man walking, and not even recognize that I'm actually dead but alive. But when I invite the Holy Spirit in, he adds a live load. And he begins to walk around my inner world and point out areas that need to be repaired. And I have to ask myself constantly, does my inner life is it strong enough to handle the weight of the Holy Spirit as he begins moving about my life? And Holy Spirit begins to point out areas that need to be fixed so that we don't collapse. Nehemiah sees the trouble that Jerusalem is in in verse 17 of chapter 2. He says, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision Derision is mockery, being laughed at. You see, there are enemies that were coming against Jerusalem. And you read through the book of Nehemiah how they just keep mocking the people. 
You'll never rebuild. It's a joke. The wall's been down for so long. You'll never rebuild. You'll never rebuild. Your life, your faith life that you're trying to build, it's not going to do it. You're not structurally strong enough. And they were being mocked and mocked and mocked. Sometimes we're mocked too in our spiritual life. The wall was in ruins for over 100 years. Do you know how long it took them to rebuild the wall? 52 days. I heard it somewhere over here. Good job. Way to go. You get a chocolate bar after if you want. 52 days. Now, does it say that Nehemiah traveled with an army of construction teams and engineers and laborers from Persia? Did it say that Nehemiah gathered up the kingdom of Persia and traveled with all of them to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls? No, it doesn't. It says that Nehemiah went. So the only thing that changed in terms of, uh, you know, personnel was Nehemiah. All the same people that lived in the city rebuilt the walls. It was not know-how. It wasn't energy or strength. It was that the mockery, the derision, had kept them frozen. And Nehemiah came in with a vision, and they rebuilt the walls in 52 days. As a church, we've been looking at prayer as our foundation in this season. That prayer is the avenue for foundation repair. In pre-service prayer at 9.30, we've had a wonderful time of interceding for all of you, for the services, for the church, even around the world. We, we went all over the world today in pre-service prayer. On Sunday evenings, we're emphasizing prayer as well because we think that prayer is the foundation for us personally for us individually and for our whole church. So I join you tonight. We'll have an evening of worship, actually, night of worship, but we'll also be praying. And I invite you at 9.30 to pre-service prayer, as you heard in the announcements. But it really is the foundation. Well, I'll close with this point. This is just a general rule, is we've got to keep the haters in our life outside of our foundation walls. Keep the haters outside. Nehemiah was uh, speaking to the people and he said, I told them of the hand of my God that have been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. The people are ready. They're like, yeah, let's do it. So they strengthened their hands for the work. Now, I don't think they just started working out. They were encouraged. They saw vision. They were inspired. But when Sembalat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper and we his servants will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. It's important to let people in that speak life and truth into us. And it's important equally to keep other people out that are toxic. Keep them outside of the walls because if you let toxic people inside the walls of your Jerusalem, your city of peace, they're going to shoot you in the back. Keep toxic people out. Keep gossip out. And invite people in to speak into our life. 
See, part of their success was to keep the haters outside of the foundation walls. What's amazing is that these people allowed the mocking to get in. To get in to the point where it froze them and they stopped building. Why build? They're right, these people who are mocking us. And then Nehemiah gives us a really good key. You have no portion or right or claim. You know, there's so many things in our life that just have no right or portion or claim. And I don't mean people, I mean even the enemy as well. I mean lies. And there's things that we've allowed to come in. And these things have built up unhealthy structures within us. Patterns of thinking, patterns of acting, desires, behavior. And again, we need to position our hearts back before the Lord and say, Lord, what are those things within me that have no right, that have no claim, that have no portion? Because if I'm going to be built into a dwelling place for the Spirit, then the Spirit decides what stays. The Spirit decides what goes. The Spirit does the building. Because I'm being built for a purpose. Like Savon Foods was built for a purpose. To have food, not cars. Right? The cars didn't belong in the produce section. But sometimes I let cars crash into me. I let things in that don't belong. What was perfectly good broccoli yesterday has become tainted with oil. And so we've got to allow the spirit to come in and to get that stuff out, that mold out, that things that don't belong out. And I need to make some hard decisions about the people I allow in. Amen, amen, amen. I'd like to invite the worship team up and again, kind of four action items which I'll invite you to do while you're in worship, but you know, ask the Holy Spirit if there's mold in our life. And just do that even now. Just Holy Spirit, is there areas of mold in my life? Spend some time, you know, today and this week assessing the foundations. Spending time in your daily time with the Lord. Pray. Be committed to prayer. I don't, I don't mean just corporate prayer with, with us here, but I really, think that, I, I really think prayer and wholeness, like internal wholeness, I think these areas are really important for us personally right now. And get toxic voices out. Maybe even ask the Lord, Lord, what's a toxic voice? I mean, if it's like your mother-in-law or something, it can't, you can't just get her out. Like, you gotta reach out and love her. But, but um, you know, other voices. By the way, I have the most wonderful mother-in-law. She's right here. I love, I love you, Mom. I love you. So, I do. I love my mother-in-law. And uh, hope in, I'm invited over for dinner at some point. Um, but you know, we do allow things in that don't belong and those things have to go out. And so as we worship, just have, have a few minutes with the Lord as well and just ask him to point out within your own heart. And we'll, we'll worship the Lord together and then I'll, I'll dismiss us.